Good evening, task force members. Pleasure. Um, continue our important work on police reform. As always, we extend our thanks and appreciation for your dedication and commitment to work on this important topic. And today we have another full agenda that will offer us a chance to continue the discussion in some very important topics in the areas of Pittsburgh police and people with disabilities, as well as uh, a discussion on immigrant and refugee communities as it relates to policing. But before we start today's uh, meeting, I would ask if you are not talking to please put your mics on mute and we will monitor uh, the anytime you have a question you like to send, we will uh, acknowledge you to allow you to speak. But before we start, I would ask co-chair Roberts if she would like to introduce our new member that is joining the task force. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Uh, we, um, the, the mayor uh, had requested that we, uh, that we add a representative of the concerned clergy of Western Pennsylvania who has been in touch with the mayor regarding police reform as well as many other issues. And the mayor uh, wanted to have that voice as a part of the task force. So in uh, reaching back to that, uh, the concerned clergy, they recommended Reverend Marie Kelly, who is the senior pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in the Hill District. Uh, Tim, of course, is very involved with the Churches on the Hill at Trinity AME. So um, I'm, I don't see your face. Let me see. I don't know. But uh, again, uh, I welcome her to be a part of this discussion. And thank you, Dr. Bullitt. I have no, nothing further. All right, as soon as she joins us, we'll uh, acknowledge her and allow her a chance to make any remarks that she may desire. Thank you. All right, um, today we have two presentations. After each presentation, we'll have it, uh, some time for group discussion and questions. At the end of both of our presentations, we will then discuss our collective efforts as it relates to completing our report and how we're going to integrate the uh, various sections into one voice. Uh, so we may take a little extra time today, uh, but I think it's time that's well worth it and we'll minimize going over on uh, future meetings. Any questions before we get started? Bobby, I would invite you to now introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. Uh, I believe that everybody received some information describing the first presentation this evening. I want to welcome Daryl Holt and Jessica Benham to the meeting who will be addressing the critically important issues of how police interact with people with disabilities, both visible and invisible disabilities, and how that intersects with race as well. So very pleased that Daryl Holt, who's a system advocate with Disability Rights PA, and Jessica Benham, who is the founder of the Pittsburgh Center for Autistic Advocacy, are joining us this evening. And uh, if you want to read more about their backgrounds, I encourage you to read uh, the extensive biographies that we sent out to you. But I'm going to turn it directly over to Daryl and to Jessica to begin their presentation. So welcome to both of you. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for, for having both of us. And I'm going to try to share my screen here so that you all can see the, the presentation that we have. Um, just While Jessica's doing that, I'll um, say a thank you for inviting us to the task force. Uh, I welcome the, the discussion and I hope you get a lot out of our presentation. While she is doing that, I'll take the liberty in um, introducing, well, I've been introduced already, uh, the, the, to say something about the organization that I represent. Um, I am a senior advocate 
Specialist for Disability Rights of Pennsylvania. Disability Rights Pennsylvania is a federally mandated uh, protection and advocacy uh, agency for the state of Pennsylvania. We're part of a network which is called National Disability Rights. And Disability Rights Pennsylvania has, uh, uh, has fulfilled uh, this mission or is continuing its mission on protecting the rights of individuals who have all disabilities. Um, we, my specific job is to uh, protect the rights of individuals with disabilities uh, in institutions as well as in the community. And so um, we deal with abuse, neglect, uh, discrimination, segregation, uh, and uh, those ills that uh, we normally deal with, people with disabilities have to deal with that and much, much more. And so uh, that's where I've worked there for 15 years and done this work. And it's been very, it's been very uh, uh, interesting work, but it's also been very uh, rewarding work. Yeah, Daryl's uh, expertise on this has been incredibly helpful as we've been developing this presentation. Um, so I, I'm one of the founders of the Pittsburgh Center for Autistic Advocacy, which is a grassroots nonprofit that is run um, by autistic adults for, for autistic adults. We uh, provide support services and have developed a community of, of other autistic adults in the greater Pittsburgh area. So we've done a lot of, of advocacy work in this area, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, so I think to, to kick it off, um, Daryl and I wanted to talk about what disability actually is, because it's not necessarily as simple as it might seem. I think all of us maybe have a sense of what we think disability is. I think it's good to, to drill down and, and really get into it. I'll sometimes joke, uh, you know, I can be wearing my glasses and nobody will say that I have a disability. But the instant that I'm walking with my cane, people will say I have a disability. And yet the glasses and the cane both basically do the same thing, right? One of them helps me see, the other one helps me with my balance when I'm walking. So why is it that in society we view one of those things as a disability and we don't think about the other one really at all when we're considering disability? Uh, so, Daryl, I don't know if you have anything you want to add there before we move on to the next slide. Yeah, disability is defined under the American with Disability Act as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or, or more major life activities. So it's a person who has a history or a record of such an impairment or a person who is perceived by others as having an impairment. So I think Jessica's example of the glasses uh, kind of fits into the latter portion of that definition. Uh, uh, the CDC estimates that one in four Americans are disabled. However, the prevalence of disability is higher in populations that are further marginalized by other facets of their identities, such as race, gender, and socioeconomic status. And that leads us into the, into the heart of our conversation right now, uh, uh, because we are talking about the population that uh, uh, is, is prevalent, but it's, it's not as known. And that population is of African Americans uh, with disabilities. And that kind of leads us into our, our next couple slides here, which is just an overview of some really common models of disability. Um, and the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, does a nice job of bridging these. Um, typically, when we think about disability, we're thinking about it in terms of medicalization, like being located and diagnosed in an individual's body. And that can be really helpful when you're trying to get a diagnosis, when you're trying to get what you need from your doctor, that can be a really useful way of thinking about it. But when we're thinking about things like policing or prisons, it's not always helpful to think about disability in terms of this, this kind of medicalizing model, which is where that part of the ADA that talks about being perceived as having a disability or treated as having a disability is really important. 
And that leads us into what's called the social model of disability. Um, so we think about the ways in which the barriers that exist in our world can disable people. Um, so, you know, I'm somebody I've got, um, because I have a connective tissue disorder that impacts my joints, um, I have days where my knees just aren't cooperating with me. And that's kind of in my body, right? But I don't feel disabled by that until I have to attend an event that has stairs and no elevator. You know, that's when it, I am actually disabled. Right. And it's about the way that those social barriers in society disable me. And I think that's really important when we're thinking about um, policing, when we, we're thinking about our carceral system, is to think about the ways in which our society is set up to discriminate against certain groups of people, to oppress certain groups of people. And certainly with what Daryl's talking about, when we're thinking about um, you know, folks who are less often diagnosed or less often understood to have disabilities, when we're thinking about race and socioeconomics, this social model is, is really helpful. This, the, yeah, the key question is, how does our system of policing in Pittsburgh have the potential to further disabled people? And so how do we fix it? Well, let's go to the first question. How does our system of policing in, in Pittsburgh have the potential to further disable? There are two problems. There are two issues here that are that are very prevalent and very up and very out there. Number one is that disability-related behaviors or difficulties, understanding that are misinterpreted by by law enforcement officials as a threat or non-compliance but are disability related. What usually happens is that we are got the man is guided by sight, basically. Sight will, will determine exactly where the judgments and where you, the perceptions come. If you look at one person and he is an African-American, you have various different perceptions of that person, okay? But what you don't see is that person maybe have a disability that either he was born with or that he had developed over time or there was an incident that happened that he, was, that he has the disability. You can't always tell by looking, by sight. Most sometimes you have to take some time with an individual in order to find out whether or not that individual has the type of disability that cannot be seen, or what we call the invisible disability. It is easier and very, and very uh, slight-minded of people, when they see a person who is disabled, they think of a physical disability, which Jessica touched on, which you're able to see, and you're able to decide that that person is disabled. But what about the person who is autistic? What is about the person who has psychiatric disabilities? who you can't see, but, but, is, uh, uh, but maybe uh, uh, an engagement with a person who is, who is a law enforcement official may engage him and, and, and has, uh, has a set of principles in his head that he has to go through. And one of the principles is that you better stay still and you better not speak. And, but the person who has a disability or has a, a, a psychiatric disability may react differently because of the nature of the of the engagement this is where the problem lies this is where the engagement this is where uh, uh the system needs to take a, a very closer look at how we engage with people with very different people with disabilities because the mental health system is very and has very different parts to it very moving parts to it so one does not fit all. One does not fit all. Uh, so that's 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 an issue. The other issue is is the culture piece, which we'll get into a little bit later. Absolutely. So some kind of quick facts and statistics that I think are really important uh, for us to keep in mind. And we don't always think about. Um, when we're talking about justice in policing or when we're talking about our carceral system, we don't always think about these things as being issues of justice for disabled people. And yet when you look at the statistics, 
it's very clear that we need to be considering disability in our decision making. So depending on which data source you look at, somewhere between a third and a half of all people killed by police officers in the United States have a disability. And the reason for the data discrepancy is that we often don't collect those statistics. Um, so a lot of this is pulled from, and I think uh, Daryl provided a, an article um, that I think Bobby sent on to all of you um, that kind of covered a little bit of this, but you have to dig into the media sources and the media doesn't always tell you, tell you either. Um, so that's the reason for the discrepancy there. But regardless, um, it's clear that it's an issue where we need to be talking about disability. Um, and then closer to home, um, at least in 2019, at least 75% of inmates at the Allegheny County Jail had a disability. And I say at least um, because I think we have to acknowledge that our jails are traumatizing. As so, and so as soon as you include trauma, as soon as you include PTSD, I think that those statistics probably uh, verge up on 100%. But in terms of what's documented by the jail itself, um, it is 75% of inmates at the jail have a disability. And so here's why we're talking about disability in this context. Uh, and then we come up on some other questions, and these are the culture piece that Daryl was kind of hinting at. Um, so I'll let Daryl take it from here. So my son who has a TBI, traumatic brain injury, okay, he suffered that uh, uh, when he got hit by a car many years ago, it was a hit and run, and he and he he, he had horrible damages. Horrible. Uh, I mean, it was just it was terrible. But he developed TBI. Now his body, his physical body, is healed. So if you see him, you will only think that uh, he's a, he's he, he's like everybody else. He walks. He talks. But what you don't see is that he's blind on his right side. He has lost depth perception on his right side. Uh, there are other dis there's other physical uh, 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 illnesses that he suffers, but you don't see them. Okay, so, long story short, he walks, he walks home from work. He goes into a park because he's trying to get home. Two police officers spot him and decide that they need to stop him because he did not see a sign in the entry of the park saying that you can't walk here uh, after 12 midnight. So they stop him, okay? They stop him, get out the car, call him over, he comes over, uh, and then he stands there and they say, where are you going? Uh, I'm going home. And so he says, hold that way. I said, I have to cut through the park to get to my, to my apartment. And so they're saying, no, you can't because it's after 12 midnight. He didn't see the sign because when you lose your depth perception and you're blind on, on the right side, and that's the right side that you lean on, that you uh, that that you are are are, are that you're used to, you're not seeing it. And, and if you're not seeing it from a distance, he has a the depth perception kind of uh, narrows that down to where you don't see the sign or you can't even read the sign from a certain distance. So therefore, but the police officers don't know that and they never did find that out because the one officer cut him off in the middle of him trying to explain what's happening. He says, look, you know, you, you, uh, 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 you, already, you already in the park, you're not supposed to be here. And what they did, they both, they took him, they cuffed him, and they took him to jail without ever knowing why he was, why, why he was, uh, why he missed the sign. And instead of, and instead of, uh, 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 of cuff, instead of letting him go or tell him, hey, just go home, because he wasn't that far from his apartment. So instead of that happening, they took him to jail. I issue this this example as a, as a and we could go into the uh, uh, to the nuances of that, but my point is that po the police officials what they did was they went no tolerance. They had no tolerance. They did not uh, uh, find out what he was doing, why why he was why he missed the sign, and it, had they found that out, a simple judgment. A simple judgment, or what they call common sense, or uh, or even a mercy, 
uh, you could put it under mercy. Uh, uh, instead of exercising that, they exercise what they've always trained and what they always know. He went into the, he went in without seeing the sign, so we got to book him and 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 take him off to jail. He didn't do anything. He didn't kill anyone or anything. But they decided that they were taking off him off to jail. Some of us might say, okay, well, all right, he got it. it that was okay. You know, that wasn't that's not okay. But that they did not beat him up or anything of that nature like they've done in the instances that we have experienced in the last couple of months or so. But nonetheless, the example is still out, outlining. The example is still outlining. People with disabilities, African-Americans with disabilities have a double stigma. It's a double, not only do they have to fight racism with their skin, now if they have a disability, it goes back to, it goes right back to slavery where the, where the master, if he wants to stop a, a runaway slave, he hobbles him, hobbling him. He cuts either he 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 shoots his leg or he puts a or he disables him in such a way that he's not as quick, he can't move, and he has to stay put. That's the type of thinking that we are that we are encountering today. And Daryl's example is really helpful because it answers these two questions, right? So people with disabilities encounter police more often than people without disabilities because our society is built in such a way that it's not accessible to us. Uh, and so, you know, you have the sign that you didn't see, right? Society is built so that people with disabilities end up encountering police more often than people without disabilities. And then in those encounters, especially when we're talking about um, a person who's black or a person who's you know, a person of color, the interactions are more negative because the officers don't take the time to find out uh, you know, the particulars of the situation. And you know, if you're talking about a disability that complicates interpersonal re uh, interactions, something like autism, that can uh, make those interactions even more difficult with police officers. Um, some other things that I think is really important to keep in mind when we talk about uh, the disproportionate ways in which people with disabilities end up having negative encounters with police is that people with disabilities are actually much more likely than people without disabilities to be victims of violence. Uh, and so to be in a situation where you're a victim of violence, but you're concerned as a person with a disability you know, that if you call your option, right, your option for dealing with violence, which right now, you know, you call, people call 911, but you're worried that rather than them addressing the problem that you're facing, that you're going to be perceived as, as the one who's causing the problem. And so, you know, this is important when we're talking about people um, who are often, often victims themselves. And Daryl, I don't know if you have more you want to add on that. If you are a Black person who is deaf, who cannot speak or can or, or, or can't hear or speak? You are uh, you are targeted for no reason at all. I believe that when when uh, when when African Americans with disabilities they have the as I said they have the additional burden of of being targeted without being understood. The deaf community. Is very inclusive, very com community. They do not trust a whole lot, and so therefore, if a police officer stops a person who is deaf, who is a young African American male who cannot hear, or maybe he's unfortunately cannot talk, what is a police officer to do? This is why specific training needs to happen training that lasts longer than a day or two days or a week or a month. It's, Allegheny County has, has, has in, in the 90s, started to address that issue, but we didn't go far enough. Didn't go far enough in it. The, the specialized, uh, the, the, uh, the segregated and intercept model that, the, uh, that Allegheny County Behavior and Health had adopted was was very good and it, it it yielded quick results, but it did not help. It did not necessarily help the African American male who is deaf and mute. Didn't help him that much because 
when you deal with a person like that, you have to be patient and you have to allow that person to do the language that he is that he's known to do the way his way of communicating and you have to understand or even know the uh, the, the mode of communication that that person has learned this is why uh, under the, a police officer is that they're supposed to protect and serve not uh protect attack and put away protect and serve that is the that is the mantra of a law enforcement officer and if you have to and, and you have to develop some patience and you have to develop a, a, a sense that uh, if you if you get the know if you if you allow the person to speak his truth in the middle of the crisis then you'll get to the truth but you won't get to it if you if you jump the gun and you pull out the pistol and you pull out the cuffs and he's got to go because he's black you're not going to get there Absolutely. And we're talking about a population that is incredibly vulnerable as well, especially if we're going to talk about black and brown folks with disabilities. Um, so here's some statistics about disability and poverty. Um, because of the ways that our government provided supports for folks with disabilities work, um, many people with disabilities end up trapped in poverty. Um, so in 2017, only 18.7% of people with disabilities in the United States were employed, and about 20% of people with disabilities live below the poverty line. Uh, and that's probably more now, considering the context of COVID. All of these statistics were before that. Um, and in Pennsylvania alone, there are about 13,000 people with disabilities who aren't receiving the services that they need. Uh, and so we're talking about a population that is already incredibly vulnerable, who doesn't have necessarily the resources that, you know, not, not even to thrive, but just to survive. And so I think it's incredibly important um, when we're having this conversation about police and people with disabilities, that we consider the context in which as a society, we are doing a very bad job of making sure that people with disabilities can live a good life. And so the big picture um, that Daryl and I kind of identified is that this isn't about good or bad individual officers. It's about a broader system in our society that it is not set up to make sure that people with disabilities have what they need. And that means that we have to address systemic racism and ableism um, and that we're funding social services so that people with disabilities encounter police less often. Now, ultimately, that should be the goal, um, I think, for any population that we're talking about, but particularly when we're talking about a population that is as vulnerable as people with disabilities, you know, this should be the ultimate goal. Uh, and I'll hand it off to, to Daryl to kind of continue on that as well. Yeah. Uh... We have to address the racism. The root, uh, the very root of racism, is integrated in in this in this problem very deeply. We uh, we have allowed a lack of understanding of who people are and what people need versus what what others have perceived of who a person is and have made uh, uh, made a judgment. On how on the very destiny of a, of, of a people that need more than just a, a, a handshake and a wink and a nod. The services I fight for the services all the time. Mental health services uh, have have improved over the years, but need more. Need more. If you're going to integrate mental health services into the police into the into the into police reform, it has to be specialized. It has to be uh, a de more detailed, specialized to to the population that you're that you that you're having, that it needs to be well funded, and it needs to, and it needs uh, a, a trained uh, a train uh, trainers trainers professionals that can can get right to the to the to the root of the of this of the situation, of the lack of integration and the lack of engagement. Uh, that seems to be happening with a lot of the law enforcement officials. I noticed myself that the law enforcement officials lately have been younger and they have not been older. So we need the, the we we need the younger ones that maybe need more time to to understand the nature 
of a job that a, that a community needs. Community needs to be protected, okay, but does not need to be attacked, okay? They need to be protected, and we need to have that, that message sent further along and than it does. Uh, a social, the social, the funding for social services most definitely need to happen. So here are kind of the four specific policies that we outlined as being really important. And of course, a lot of these apply um, beyond talking about disability. And I think what's really important to remember about our presentation um, is that we're talking about the intersection of multiple kinds of uh, systemic problems. We're talking about racism, we're talking about ableism, we can talk about transphobia as well, that all of these um, you know, are problems that many of these uh, solutions that we're talking about can also apply to. And some of these I think Daryl has talked about um, throughout, uh, but I think it's important that we're funding social workers, trained mediators, mental health professionals, et cetera, um, for helping to answer those calls that are related to disability or mental health. Um, that we're funding social services that are aimed at decreasing houselessness, helping people who use drugs, decreasing interpersonal violence, decreasing, de decreasing suicide, et cetera, decreasing all of those places where anybody um, might unnecessarily have to encounter police officers, that we are solving these social problems before they ever become a problem. Uh, that we strengthen our independent civilian police review board and that we're improving our data gathering so that we have an accurate picture of what these interactions between people with disabilities and police look like. And most importantly, that we're making sure that that data is publicly available. I think transparency is incredibly important here. Um, so Daryl, I will go ahead and let you kind of talk about and add on to those as well. Um, and that little note at the bottom, you know, this is one small part of the puzzle of what we're talking about here. You know, we need every level of government to do their part. Yeah, in closing, uh, uh, in, in closing, thank you, Jessica, and and, and I, I'm just going to tag on to what you just, how uh, of the four recommendations that we're presenting here before the task force, you know, that uh, 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 once again uh, 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 we need to we need to strengthen areas of of training. Uh, 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 and not just strength in areas of training. I mean, let's define them, the detail, where are we going to target it, the training, and, 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 how, and how that's going to happen. If you're going to have police officers and mental health professionals uh, uh, working together, then communication needs to be real clear. They need they need to, the police official need to understand have a basic understand of the mental health system and 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 you need officers who are willing to think twice before they act that they won't that they won't reach for it and 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 think again before they act on on whatever that they need to do uh, my my father was a police officer for 15 years in Philadelphia. He used to tell me, he said, you know, you, you have to learn to give some thought to the person you're serving before you take action. And he didn't say a, a, a long thought. You have to get, you have to train your mind to think first about the person you're engaging before you engage them in the way you want to. You have to do that. And I think that goes along with the training with the training that I'm talking about. I'm emphasizing that quite a bit. Social services, yeah. So, uh, so I was a social service worker for many years, for about as about long as I've been with DRP. And I know that it's not, that the funding is there, but it's not enough. But th that'll come if we, if we uh, 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 totally uh, uh, dedicate, invest ourselves in this, in this plan. Strengthen the civilian board, yeah, you need to do that. Uh, I'm not so clear about how we would do that, how we strengthen it, but yeah, that's a good start as far as engaging in communication. And finally, the data. I am surprised that, that there is not data that we have in tracking uh, 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 how, uh, how, how police officers are, are acting towards uh, uh, people with disabilities. I am surprised, and, and that is something I am going to start advocating for 
because that needs to happen. We need clear data so you can get an accurate picture on what the needs are and to fill the gaps that seem to be that seem to be there and always there uh, 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 in dealing with uh, community engagement. There, uh, I'm not saying there never should be gaps, but let's try to get those gaps in there because we have been dealing this for a long time. And it's usually been, been a, 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 a slight of conversation uh, uh, in some way, or manner, or form. But in today's culture, we can't let this continue on. We have got to do something. We have got to make definitive changes in the system. The system has to change. The system has to change. And I'll close out with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, we're open for, for any Q&A that, uh, that folks might have. I had a couple, if I may. Uh, Mr. Holtz? Yes, sir. I found your story of your son. I, I worked at Mayview State Hospital 31 and three quarter years as a volunteer coordinator. We dealt with mentally, mentally ill and those who, had, uh, who, who were mentally disabled otherwise. And we had children for a while and teenagers. So I found that story uh, rather disturbing. My, my first question was, and I guess you can't answer this, was why, didn't, why did they feel the need to cuff him and take him to jail versus giving him a summons or a ticket? I mean, it wasn't like he was out there shooting people, Good as question. you said. I mean, that just seemed ridiculous to go to yeah. jail for that. The whole thing is, is Mr. Stevens, the whole thing is ridiculous. Well, yeah. You know, but I'll tell, I'll answer your question. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, uh, however, because I, I'm, I, and I, this is going to be an assumption. I think that because it was so late and because he was already in the park, mm -hmm. he already was in the park, so the summons wouldn't have worked. The summons would have been okay. We caught you right at the at the at the at the entry of the park. You know, we we could we could let you go, or or, or we can give you the summons. Well, I gave him a ticket. Already, he was okay. already in the park. Did and, you ask? And, did and, you and ask? The is, and the assumption is, sir, the assumption yeah. that he already the, the assumption is, and it's a false assumption that he knew what he was doing. Gotcha. Okay that he already seen the sign, but he decided that he's going to go on ahead anyway. Now for him, he did not, he did not fight back, though he did give them some lip service, you know, asking why, or what are you doing? Huh. Are you gonna cuff me? Why? You know, but at that point it was, for them, it, it, they had gone too far. They already made a decision based on, on, uh, on, uh, on, on where he was, the lateness of the hour uh, uh, that he broke, that he broke, you know, to them that he uh, 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 he disobeyed an, uh, uh, an instruction or a sign, and he already went. So there you go. And uh, I was just curious if, if if you had talked to the police later or somebody in the family. I, I didn't know. I did not get the chance. No, okay, I did you? not. I did not get a, get that opportunity. Okay, I happen to be chairing the subcommittee and several of our members are on the call on recruiting, hiring, training, and education. I have a very specific uh, request of you and Jessica, if I may, if you accept. I'd like you to dig deeper and come up with what I call summary points because uh, we have an anti-violence initiative, the Coalition Against Violence, so we don't say bullet points, but <laughs> summary points as many specific ideas as you have that we could recommend to the mayor and to the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police in terms of training. Very specific, you don't have to say them now, you mentioned a couple. Uh, you mentioned about training in general. Uh, you mentioned about, I thought about maybe a section in the police training for disabilities in general, or an expanded section. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the training expanded. should last more than a day. You mentioned uh, <laughs> strengthening in general. Uh, uh, so if you all could provide us 
after you, after this conversation, and your other staff members and volunteers, whatever, to just think literally of everything you can think of. I was talking to Valerie today, Valerie McDonald Roberts, our coach here. I think our goal collectively should be, certainly is mine, that we come up with the most comprehensive set of policy proposals anywhere in the nation to reform policing in Pittsburgh. The most comprehensive in the nation, pulling on everything that we can find across the nation, calling upon our own experts locally and our own little brains, whatever size they may be, so we can, we can come up with a very profound, comprehensive, and strong set of recommendations. Would you agree to that recommend, uh, that request? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can certainly do that. Uh, some of the difficulty, of course, is, you know, it's not, it's not just the officers that are coming in, you know, for the academy. Uh, we want to make sure that officers that have been around for a while also are having access to this as a kind of continuing education. That um, would be one of your summary points. Yes. Continue yeah, so, education for those who've been on the force for years. Yeah, because um, the officers that are coming through the academy now um, do do they do get some disability related training, particularly I think on deafness and on autism. Um, certainly, there could be more. So I think it's you know important to remember too. Uh, training only goes so far when it comes to some of those um, biases that we that we all hold, um, mm -hmm. and so we have to be engaging in broader cultural change as well. Exactly, and um, and I, and you brought up a good point because I, I don't recommend that we endow the 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 law enforcement system with the whole. <laughs> mental health system. I mean, I'm keen on certain, on, on, and this is why we need data. I'm keen on a certain population of, of the people with disabilities who they, who they engage more with, more with. And that, so that gives us a more, uh, that, get, that narrows the field down in, in how much training we can, we can give them. Without data, without the, that type of data, you're, you're left with you left you're left with an open field. I don't think an open field is 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 the is the right type of uh, 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 thing to leave uh, 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 the law the uh, the police. I think we ought to narrow it down to the, whom they engage more with, who is in the community more that they engage more with, who is in the community more, and 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 uh, and in the training be targeted for that specific population as a starting point. I'm saying as a starting point. And certainly we can, you know, look at some of the data that's available nationally. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, as we develop that sort of first list for you all. But definitely, you know, going forward, I think the data gathering is, is a big part of this. Yes. Um, okay. I yeah, I have I'm sorry. Okay, I have a question. And um, Daryl, it's good to see you and sure, say hello yeah. to everybody. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I think some of this um, goes back to recruitment and the people that we select. And there's a meanness sometimes that's there. Um, I look at there is a um, a college. Uh, in Vermont, in Putney, Vermont. And um, it is for students who have Asperger's, autism, a variety of, um, of, of disorders. But these are folks that just looking at them, you wouldn't know anything um, was any different with them. It's curious to me how they never have police problems there with those students. And I'm sure that just meandering through the small town, you know, they, they have seen some things here and there. So what, is it training? What kind of training? What do they do? What are they doing in Putney or Brattleboro, Vermont, the larger city? What, how do they work with their police officers so that they are sensitive to the needs and concerns of these maybe 500 plus students that attend this residential college that the parents are paying $60,000 a year for their child to attend. 
I mean, they my, don't have the issues that I see sometimes on television. And if I can see and I know that person, there's something more than just someone acting out. If I know it and I've got an untrained mind, why don't you know it? So, I, off the top of my head, my guess would be it's about that broader cultural acceptance, right? That in that town, people have developed an understanding. Um, and, a, and a sense of community. And certainly, you know, I think about it on, you know, I live up in the South Side Slopes. Um, and in my neighborhood, there's a, you know, a couple folks who I'm kind of aware of, um, who maybe, you know, to somebody who was an outsider, would see them doing something, view it as violent or destructive and call the police. Um, and there would be the potential for that encounter. Um, but in, you know, in places that have a broader cultural understanding and acceptance of difference and of disability, um, are going to develop relationships with people in a way that doesn't result in that even initial call to the police, um, that you kind of negotiate and, and solve it your, yourself. I think that's part of it. Um, and certainly when we're talking about broader cultural acceptance of people with disabilities, recognition of uh, of, you know, who they are and just sort of that's that informed sight of, on somebody um, that would extend to the police officers, I would imagine as well. Would love to see what their training is though. But that's mm -hmm. my guess kind of off the top of my head. Just to make my request clear. Okay. This, this group will disband in X number of weeks as the mayor's task force. So we want to get every piece a recommendation on paper now. Absolutely. So I want to urge the, I want to get the urgency of now in there. So is it possible for you all to do that within a, a, a week or at least not more than two weeks? I would think yeah. not necessarily a week, but certainly within two weeks. Two Excellent. weeks is fair. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, two missed, weeks is fair. Yes. I missed the, missed the app. Nathaniel? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, uh, um, thanks, Dr. Bullock. Um, hi, Jess, um, and uh, hello, Daryl. Um, thank you both for your presentation. It was really helpful. Um, I wanted to ask: Is there um, are there is, is there are there regular meetings between the PBP and representatives of um, you know the disability community? I don't know whether it's quarterly, semi-annually, annually, or what have you, where they're sitting down with the disability community and reviewing the performance over the quarter or whatever it is, um, looking at the number of incidents, the met, whatever there, if there are metrics, reviewing the metrics. Um, that way, I guess what I'm getting at is um, trying to encourage accountability on a regular basis rather than a reactionary basis for when you know incidents occur of use of force or worse. And I just wanted to get a sense of what that relationship is right now, or, or is it just a reactionary response for when incidents occur? Uh, so that goes a little bit back to the data gathering in the sense that I'm not sure that we actually gather data on encounters between uh, police and people with disabilities. Um, and certainly if we do gather that data, it's not public. Um, so when I was looking at, for example, that number on 75% of um, folks who are held in the Allegheny County Jail, it took me two hours to find that number and I'm someone who is very skilled at, at, at research and at finding those things out. Um, and that was based off of folks who received disability services at the jail. Um, so it wasn't like they were asking everybody, do you have a disability as though there were a checkbox for them to check. Uh, it was based on the services that people were getting. Um, so I'm not, it does go back, we need that data. Um, but to answer your, your bigger question, to my knowledge, that is not happening. Um, certainly there are relationships. I know that, um, you know, one of the larger autism organizations in the greater Pittsburgh area um, engages in um, training some of the new recruits and certainly has that pre-existing relationship. I do believe there's some relationship that is happening with the local deaf community, um, but certainly nothing that's broadly organized. Uh, Daryl, do you know of anything? No, no, I, I, I don't know if there's any organization that is, is ab having uh, uh, meetings with the with the law enforcement officials in that in that context, I I would advocate for that because once again we're we it's it's setting foundations. 
is setting foundations that probably has never been set. You know, I, 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 the, the feeling is, the, the perception is, is that people with disabilities, are they get, they get the services, they get the money, and that's it, okay? They, well, there's nothing else going on. But you forget that, that there are, there's a population of people that encounter the police in a way that is very familiar. It happens, it doesn't happen some, it doesn't happen quite as frequently with, with, uh, uh, with the, the Caucasian community as it does with the African American community. You just don't hear about it because we're used to saying, we used to say, well, there ain't nobody else, that nobody else is gonna defend me or nobody else is gonna be on my side so we, so that's it, we're isolated. So if that was the, if that was to happen, that would start a, a, an interesting dynamic and going a long way in us reaching out to, to, to the law enforcement officials and helping them to understand a system that everyone now is, is throwing at them <laughs> very quickly. And, and it's unfortunate, but I want them to understand the system before we start, in, start, we start engaging uh, uh, the dynamics of what is needed for uh, to help them out. Because clearly they need that help. Daryl and Jessica, yes. could you put that as one of your recommendations? Yes, I could. Back to us. Yes, we could. In some form of an engagement with the police quarterly or some time on the calendar. And yes. um, I just have a quick follow up. That's really helpful, your responses. Thank you. But, um, and, and not to give you all more homework, because I know that Tim's already assigned you a bunch of homework. <laughs> but um, I can't help myself. If, if you could, what would be helpful too is to understand um, if you could consider what metrics and data you would like to be, um, to see be collected, um, that would be helpful to, to understand that. You know, yeah. I don't know what other cities are doing. We can definitely do that. Yeah, we can Thank do you. that. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Angela? Yes, um, so following up on Nat's comment, not just collected, but what you'd like to see reported and in what format. The um, other thing, and you don't have to answer now, but if you know of any locations that are doing this well, any police departments that ha are good models for us to look at, if you could include that one. And Daryl touched on this one, and Jessica, I don't know if, if you had a response, but the third recommendation around strengthening the C um, Civilian Police Review Board if you could go a little bit deeper into what you meant by that one. Sure, um, yeah, so when we're thinking about uh, independent civilian police review boards, the important thing is for them to be truly independent, um, but also to have um, some sort of enforcement capability, right? The ability to actually call officers before them um, and some sort of say in the disciplinary process, I think is important, uh, you know, I. I know a lot of, of police officers want to see see justice done well. I think a lot of them, you know, are nervous about about their jobs when they when we're talking about an independent civilian police review board. But you know, police officers also work for us, so I think it's important um, that citizens have some sort of say in in the process. Hey, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Could you hey. provide us your PowerPoint? Are you comfortable with that? Sure. <laughs> I can definitely email that out. Uh, David. Thank you very much. It was a, this was a very, very helpful and interesting presentation. Uh, I just want to uh, read to you a statement from one of our members who could not be here today, um, uh, Patricia Lefwich. Uh, she's very concerned about this because she's very close to somebody who, uh, who has a disability. Uh, and she says the following, quote, please ask our guests about implementing ASL, uh, American Sign Language Basics, as a requirement for police education and training. I'd like to know how we can make that happen because hearing impaired deaf persons must use their hands to communicate and it can be misconstrued as resisting arrest or noncompliance. I did hear one of you speak a little bit about that, but I wanted to make sure her question got out there in its full form. Absolutely, it's a little dangerous, um, you know, so there's some pros and some cons. I think it's good broadly for everybody in society to learn a little bit of ASL. Uh, you know, it is a, a really useful second language, um, especially for communicating with deaf people. But deaf people have a right to a certified ASL interpreter. 
in interactions with with police officers and in prisons. And I, you know, my concern with viewing teaching ASL to police officers as a replacement for that, that could be a problem. Um, so, you know, I think it's good for police officers to have some familiarity with ASL, certainly to recognize it, to recognize that somebody else is using it is really important. Um, but it is the right for an ASL, a, a deaf person to have a certified ASL interpreter and that goes for any encounter with police. So police officers, maybe this should be part of the training, should know that if they're interacting with somebody who uses ASL, that they need to uh, honor a request for interpreter and wait for that interpreter to get there, that that is the right of, of that person. So a little bit of, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and Daryl, you know, feel free to add on to that, uh, but those are my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. However, I see the, yeah, I see the difficulty in that because once again, that community, uh, the, the difficulty in, in communicating, uh, 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 you have to, uh, back again. Okay. yeah, you have to uh, 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 be very cautious. Uh, so in the training, you know, before we training, the, uh, the community needs to talk about uh, 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 how how a person how how a person who is deaf uh, and and mute or deaf mute or, or in the deaf community how they can tr how they can communicate effectively with the with the uh, law enforcement uh, community if, if so that it will not be so that it won't end up being a tragedy if you understand what I'm saying. If we could, if we could find a way in the language part of it to 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 delve into ASLs and sign language and see what works and what we can what we can train not not just the police but but the community in and of itself because the community has to has to engage so that they know how to respond. So it's not so, and that's it's it's not the onus on so much on the on the on law enforcement people, but it's also on the community as well. And that's where that we can bridge, get that bridge a lot closer, and build that bridge uh, to a in a firmer uh, to a firmer foundation. We have about five more minutes in this discussion. I'd like to ask Richard, Valerie, uh, to uh, present your question. I, I got two questions that maybe you can answer them quick. Um, are you suggesting that a mental health worker and a social worker go out on certain calls with um, police officers? I'm not suggesting that. Okay. I, I, no, Rich, I'm not suggesting it. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's what's out there now. But my the reason why I'm not suggesting it is because mental health is has a lot of moving parts and you cannot you cannot subject uh, uh police officers uh in in the, uh, you cannot subject uh mental health officials in the line of work of police officers because then that's that's crossing lines and then you get then you get a new new set of dynamics right. that cause new problems i will say there are some people in the disability community who would like to see that Yes. Um, so certainly that's Definitely. something to keep in mind that there, you know, is a, a significant part of that community who thinks that a, a first response team that is broader than just police would be useful. Um, from my perspective, I think it's important to make sure that people have the services that they need um, so that we don't get those calls, right, or we right. get fewer of those calls. Um, that, you know, to me seems like it's, a, you know, a, a good way to, it's just to prevent that from happening in, in the first place, that people are getting the mental health services that they need already. Um, that, you know, I think, but certainly, you know, keep in mind that there are definitely parts of the disability community who would like to see social workers, trained mediators, um, et cetera, as, as part of those teams. So, like, I'm in the weeds, I'm in the weeds with a lot of the, uh, stuff that uh, we've been talking about thus far. Um, and I can see the pros and cons to some of it, um, but I, I would, I, my only worry is that if something would happen to any one of those workers on the call, what the blowback would be. 
And, you know, there are, the argument that I hear back from folks in the community is that, you know, will it be different from the blowback that happens when a police officer is injured in a situation like that? Um, you know, will it be any different? And so that, you know, I think is, is a question for all of us to be thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Valerie? Dr. Bullock, thank you. Um, I'll just very quickly ask questions. I don't expect answers. Maybe um, Jessica, run, Jessica, run. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! But um, if we could, um, if you could please just get back to me. First of all, have you all ever had a conversation with either um, the proper staff member administrator in the police department about um, engaging uh, policies and training and what have you with the disability community in addition to what they what training there is uh, in the police academy for recruits and uh, have you had a conversation with um, the uh, disability section within the department of city planning um, I would have to defer to staff I don't I just know that I don't know there was a little flux in terms of who was leading it because of the demise of the um, the former director, Rich, mm -hmm. you know, Rich. So um, uh, have you had a conversation? Uh, yes, I've been part of, of conversations and I've actually led um, autism specific training for first responders, um, not just in city of Pittsburgh, but actually in several places throughout Allegheny County. Um, and that was not just for, um, you know, new officers. There were a lot of, of officers who'd been around a long time who, who attended that as well. Um, and, you know, I think the officers that chose to, because it was voluntary, that chose to attend that training already had the mindset of wanting to understand. And so I think the difficulty is reaching those officers who aren't there yet, who don't have that, that mindset yet. Um, but yes, I've been part of those conversations. Um, you know, and I think I've, I've had to step back from a lot of that, um, because as you mentioned, you know, running for office. Um, but I, I do believe a lot of those conversations are, are ongoing, um, you know, and I think more needs to happen. Okay. And uh, are there ID bracelets or cards that, um, that uh, people within the disability community, particularly like you said, autism spectrum, are there, is there any identification, you know, with the blind, if they have a white cane, it's kind of like, you know, but with, with um, intellectual disabilities, mental illness, et cetera, what do you have? So there's a couple things. Um, so some people do carry a little ID card that says, you know, I have autism, here's, you know, some things to expect. Uh, the difficulty with that, of course, is you're reaching some place to grab it, to hand it. Um, you know, we, we know there's the potential for some trouble there. Uh, but I was actually working on a bill um, with Senator Lindsey Williams for a designation that would go on the back of a driver's license, um, right. like where you would see the need for corrective lenses. Um, so, you know, there is some of that in motion. Uh, I, I don't think that that's moved uh, out of committee, but the bill exists. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. And last question, mm -hmm. what is PWD in your PowerPoint? A person with disability. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Um, that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I saw Allah Muhammad, your hand came up. Yeah. Are you going to make an announcement? Like, I just wanted to address the point that um, came up earlier. There is a, an ADA coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh, who I, Hillary Roman, who uh, we would be happy to connect you all with. Uh, she would be a really great resource to, um, to you all as you, have the, as you continue to have these conversations and, and plan for trainings or whatnot. Yeah, very, very good. I'm a fan. Well, uh, Jessica Benham and Daryl Holtz, on behalf of the Police Reform Task Force, would like to extend our thanks and appreciation for you taking time to come and speak to us about the various experiences and challenges faced by persons with disabilities. You enlightened our views, provided us some great information, and then you also got several assignments from task force members that we appreciate your assistance with. Um, this is important work, 
and we want to ensure that the information that we gather is a part of our report that goes forth. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time and thank you, uh, Dr. Gear, for making the recommendation and Dr. Reynolds for uh, supporting this effort as well. All right. well. Thank you for having us and for all of the great questions. All right. And if thank you could you share your much. PowerPoint with us, we'll place that into our Google folder. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. We are ready for our second presentation uh, on the um, immigrant and refugee communities as it relates to policing. And I will ask co-chair Roberts to introduce uh, the Welcoming Pittsburgh Task Force. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. And uh, this is an important constituency within a growing community. It's a, it's a growing demographic within Pittsburgh and basically just adding to our diversity. Um, I have worked with um, Ala on this to, uh, to gather this at the last minute, but nonetheless, Welcoming Pittsburgh has been an initiative uh, within the mayor's office since 2014. So, um, and uh, there have been people who have uh, led the efforts in uh, expanding it from Betty Cruz to Alexis Vargas um, to Bay Alibi, and now we have um, Allah. So I'm going to defer to Allah and um, Monica Rest to uh, introduce the speakers and to uh, uh, kick off the discussion. Monica and Allah. Sorry, my dog was barking and I didn't think he would be good for an introduction, but thank you so very much. Great. Um, a lot, did you want to introduce or I can go ahead? I think it doesn't really matter. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, and uh, as Valerie said, you know, uh, I've worked with uh, Welcoming Pittsburgh for quite some time and I really appreciate the time, uh, especially right now, to make sure that uh, the voices are being heard so that when decisions are being made, uh, people have these things kind of at the front of their mind. And um, so I wanted to welcome the team that joined us. Um, I know that we have um, Dr. Yinka Williams on the line. Um, I hope, I thought I've I saw I've seen her. Dr. Williams come on and drop off a couple of times, so I'm hoping she comes back on at some point. Okay. Great, so uh, why don't we start, uh, Jose Diaz is also on the line, and, um, and, and so is Kier. So I will let them each uh, introduce themselves and then you know, start with the presentation that they have. Uh, okay, um, I guess I'll go first, uh, if that's okay. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Jose Diaz, as I always mentioned. Um, a job I work for the CA of Greater Pittsburgh as their senior director for community outreach and impact. Um, I've been affiliated with the Welcoming Pittsburgh team for a few weeks now. I can hear their perspective and, and on, um, Mr. Diaz, you have a bad, bad connection. connection. I do? Oh, man. Uh, you, can you? You come in and out and then it gets uh, muffled. Okay. Um, can anyone, it's for can now, Jose. Okay, it's good now. Maybe you're closer to the mic. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. I will try this again. So, um, as I mentioned in my day job, I work for the YMCA of Greater Pittsburgh as their senior director of community outreach and impact. I've been affiliated with the Welcoming Pittsburgh team for, for several weeks now. So, just to have to share my thoughts and perspective on um, this particular topic. Um, and speaking very quickly just about it. Um, you know, as a, as a value McDonald mentioned, I think if you look at uh, uh, it's, wait, it's no, I'm sorry. Back. It's, it's 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 muffled again. Okay, I'm gonna stop there uh, to see if I can work on some of this stuff over here, and then if somebody else wants to jump in and introduce themselves, that'd be cool. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, you can do that. Yep. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Kia Muguaneza. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. So my name is Kia Muguaneza. I work for Allegheny Health Network. I'm a member of the uh, Welcoming Pittsburgh. I've been uh, a member from the beginning. 
uh, with the welcoming Pittsburgh uh, with the mayor's office. Um, so we, we, are, we are just here to uh, talk a little bit about the immigrant communities and the issue is uh, how, uh, how they are related to the uh, uh, police and uh, the work that you're doing, just to, to give you some ideas. And you are with uh, Monica, so uh, you're in good hands. She'll take good care of you guys. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the things that I think is uh, we notice in, the, in some of these communities, oh, before I say that, um, to Valerie's point, the immigrant community in Pittsburgh is growing, but it's also very, very diverse. So that's, that's, a, that's a key uh, to understand, you know, if you're talking about the Latino community, even within that community, it's diverse. If you're talking about the African community, even some of the country, like the Congolese refugees and immigrants, you can find very easily 10 Congolese and they speak different languages. So that's just one example. So we have uh, Iraqis, we have Syrians, and those are the, uh, some of the groups that we have, uh, have come to Pittsburgh either by coming as immigrants or just coming as refugees. So, but one, the mo one, of, one of the most important thing that I think is really important to emphasize, which surprisingly is not very different from probably what you guys have been talking about, is first of all, communication. Communication, especially when you're talking about uh, refugee and immigrants who are, who, don't speak uh, English. Their 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 English is limited, or they don't speak English at all. So, like I said before, we have people who are fluent in English, and you have people who speak no English whatsoever. Um, you have people who are familiar with the Western culture because of the countries where they came from, but then you have other people who come like the complete opposite. So everything they're doing here is adjusting, including how they interact with the police including even seeing a police in uniform. For some of them, it's not a good experience. So that's something that we have to keep in mind with communication, making sure that we have the, uh, the uh, right tools for language, but also part of communication is understanding people's culture. Again, very different, uh, diverse groups, uh, understanding their culture is very, very important. So if you combine the two, language and culture, that's going to help a lot with communication. Um, the other, so how do you do that? I think uh, other than uh, just having interpretation available, having uh, interpretation through the phone, you need to connect with people in this community. Um, you need to have community liaison. I saw uh, in the previous presentation, somebody had uh, suggestions on the policies. Uh, or looking at best practices in other areas. We can do that as well. There are places where they have community liaisons who are working with the police. If you can't hire, the best, the best of the practice will be to hire from these communities. And that's a possibility. I know in the past, some of the people who have applied, but for some reason didn't go through or they went halfway. I know it's a very, very tough process, uh, but that would be the best. But if that's not possible, at least get the connection from those people and get the community liaison to work with the police. That would be very, very important. Um, and that adds to building the trust in the community because pe once you work with the people in the community directly, they know this community, but these communities, they know their community very well. They know the cultures that we're talking about, but they also know the other organizations like uh, Casa San Jose, like uh, J uh, Jewish Family and Children's Services, like Hajapo. They already know people who have re received and work with this family from the moment they arrived here. They trust them, so you're already making that connection. Um, the other thing that I think, again, I mentioned this before, but it's very, very important that we keep this in mind as we work with this. Um, then I can pass it back to Jose. Um, is again, understanding the uniqueness and the diversity among refugee and immigrant. And when it comes to refugee, maybe Jose can talk more at large about immigrants. I've worked with refugees with settlements specifically. Every couple of years, there's a certain group of uh, refugees that would come. Uh, the focus will be on a certain group. So in the last few years, it's been mostly Bhutanese refugees. But now we are seeing more Congolese refugees. So how can we put in place uh, the inf infrastructure and tools to make sure that they adjust to that changes that every few years you'll see different groups and you will need to be able to adjust to that structure. 
Um, so depending on how the refugees uh, uh, program goes, now that is very slow, but if it grows in the next few years or so, that's something we have to keep in mind with the diversity of the community and the changing of the communities and the languages and all that. So that's why I feel like that, you know, co making that connection within the community, we having a community liaison will be a very, very important key. Um, hello, this is Yinka Ganga Williams. I just want to say I am on. Um, I'm having some technical issues being able to show my face, but I think for those of you who know me, hi, I'm here. Hi, Yinka. Hi. You can actually go ahead. Could you, could you uh, go ahead and actually introduce yourselves for those who don't know you? Okay. Um, my name is Nyinka Aganga Williams. I am originally from Nigeria and I have been in this country, specifically in Pittsburgh, for 20 years. Um, about 19 years ago, I co founded this organization called Acculturation for Justice, Access, and Peace Outreach. And that started at um, St. Benedict the Moor. If, um, I believe there's a church that everybody knows that's across the road from um, where we now have our dear lady kind of camping about her kid with Duquesne University. So specifically we resettled refugees and we resettled refugees from all over the world. And um, currently, I'm the executive director. I still believe I have worked with quite a few people that I can see here, either during the mayor's election or immediately after trying to place quite a number of issues on the table regarding immigrants. So I'm glad that um, I am part of this today. Um, Ala, if you would let me know when you really need to hear from me apart from this introduction. Thanks, Dr. Williams. Um, so Kier just went ahead before you and, and talked a little bit about uh, language, the importance of language and cultural understanding when it comes to communication between police and the diversity that exists within immigrant communities. If you have any um, recommendations or just want to talk about what you see as well, that would be helpful. Um, I think what Kia said was very, very relevant. The language is a big part of it. And what does that mean? It means you find someone on the street, you find out there is something going here as a police officer or any law enforcement officer. You want to help, but you don't even know where to start because you cannot communicate with that person. So where do you really start? And at times there are things that are acts, critical acts of what you consider criminal as a police officer or as a law enforcement officer. So you're really acting upon the actions that you have seen immediately. Um, but there is um, a whole lot of loaded actions before whatever it is that you see may have happened, even while we cannot tolerate whatever it is that has happened. I'll quickly tell you a story. They call me storyteller, but that's because I believe in the realities of life. 2002 when we had the Sudanese young men started arriving in Pittsburgh. They were resettled in an area where it is a pocket of poverty amongst the affluent. And what they will normally do based on their own experience from their country and the fact that these kids left home when they were five, six, left their parents and had to go to another country before they ended up here, was they were taught to work in groups. In groups, if anything was happening, you, somebody will always be able to tell the others. So when they got to the United States, what they did was also to work in groups in these affluent communities. And the affluent people in the community called the police and then said, we have this group of black boys who just walk around here. We don't feel comfortable with them walking around our community. Who wouldn't? We had a meeting with the police. We called in some members of the community. What did the police tell us and them? The police critically, amongst other things, told them, we are here to serve you. We are your friends. 
That was taken literally. Two, three days later, the young man again in a group saw a police patrol car driving around. They stopped the patrol car. And the police asked them, what is it that you want? And they said, you told us the other day you are our friend. So we're just calling you or stopping you to say hello. And that to them literally is what it is. You are our friends. How then truly can the police be the friends of the immigrant community? Many of us come from places where what we consider domestic violence here is considered civil cases in their community. The husband slaps the wife, you even go to the police station and you are being told, go and settle it, this is a civil manner, a civil matter rather. Besides that, don't you guys have families that can help you resolve this? Why are you coming to the police station? So some people are already kind of entrenched in this kind of um, judgment that the case within me and my wife is within me and my wife. It has nothing to do with the police. This happens when they come here, we try to tell them domestic violence, we have zero tolerance with it, but many still do not understand the in-depth that really the police will get you, you're gonna go to jail, and that can affect even your immigration progression. So you've been in jail once, if you go twice, twice, of course, that's a big no-no for immigration. Many do not know this. Don't beat your child. Yes, that's the way we discipline our child at home, where we come from. You tell us not to discipline them, don't beat them here. Tell us something else we can do because we just cannot let the children be without any kind of discipline. And so you will find sometimes that our immigrants will beat their kids and this could be male, female. The next thing is the police is called in that they were being brutal, off they go to jail. Again, it affects the rest of their lives here, whether for jobs or for other things that they may want to do. There are times when truly you find out that there are so many things that just happens here that for them it's completely different. Um, a guy who urinates in the park and just think he can get away with it and before he knows it, there is somebody else kind of right on his right hand side and he's been fined $160. That is all the money he has earned in a week. So for the police, therefore, to be able to serve this community, I believe what the actions the city had taken earlier part of this year and late last year, which is to provide the police and law enforcement generally with training to better understand who the immigrants that are around here are. There are people being picked up sometimes um, and the minute law enforcement finds out that they can't speak the language, automatically you are illegal, which is not true. People come in here with different kind of visas. And once you're thrown in with eyes, it takes a much, much, much longer time before you can really resolve issues and find out who is this person and who is it that we really need to communicate with to be able to get, you know, kind of the people out. So as um, Elia said, it is important that those of us in the community who serve the immigrants, it's important for us to kind of um, be known so that you'll have a point of reference if there is anything going on. I had a little bit of the discussion on disabilities. Due to all the stress and all the pains that it takes, many of our people have really seen deaths right in front of them, whether it's of parents or families and the rest. The children have seen a lot before they get here. So mental illness is not very far. And when that happens and you pick up somebody on the street and you don't know what to do with them because you think everything is normal, it is very, very difficult for both you as law enforcement, for the person that is involved and for we ourselves. We have had police officers who have been kind enough to really think this is a very abnormal situation, take them to the psychiatric hospital. But we have also had those who decided no, they're just going to be in jail until whenever it is. How do we therefore kind of find the line between 
Um, this too, again, is a question of training, information, um, who are the connectors that can really help us help um, quite a number of um, the immigrants that are here and in such conditions. I think I would like to stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. And Jose, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I think so. If you want to go ahead and try to introduce yourself again. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Jose Diaz. I work for the YMCA of Greater Pittsburgh as the Senior Director for Community Outreach and Impact. I um, have been at the Y for about six years, and the past few weeks I've been affiliated with the Welcoming Pittsburgh team. So uh, happy to be here and just happy to share my perspectives on the growing uh, burgeoning immigrant communities here in Pittsburgh and what that could mean for um, relationship with law enforcement and just beyond. Um, I really, really like this conversation that's been had so far around um, language and culture. Um, one of the things that I'm reminded of, and I shared this with Monica um, the other day as you know, thinking about this meeting, um, last summer I was uh, doing a series of focus groups um, as part of some consultation work and we were looking at uh, decriminalized, um, disproportionate uh, contact for minority youth in the criminal justice system. And so we were interviewing, we were interviewing various um, folks in these focus groups. Some of the folks we interviewed were um, representatives from Casa San Jose and they made some good points that have stayed with me, you know, for the past year in thinking about this work. They were talking about how oftentimes even something as basic as literature in schools is not made readily available in different languages. And so what you have is students that are going to school and maybe the students speak, um, you know, they speak English as a, as a language, but their parents may speak another language as their primary language. And so literature is not being produced in multiple languages to meet those family household needs. And, you know, speaking for myself as someone who, who is a product of Spanish speaking adults in my household, oftentimes you'll find that um, students are put in a very unique position of having to go home and translate these materials to their parents in different languages, right? Um, you know, a friend of mine, she is from Ecuador and she had to translate some documents for her father because they were all in English and he had no idea what they said. Um, and so you see that happening here in Pittsburgh play out in the school system where, you know, literature is not being produced in multiple languages. And so because of that, parents are missing out on opportunities like attending parent conferences, attending community meetings, knowing what's happening in the schools regarding their child. Um, and that can also that can also place some barriers uh, with respect to law enforcement. If you have youth that may have gotten in trouble with law enforcement, how is that information being communicated back to parents? How are they understanding the um, the ramifications of this. What, what are their rights? How do they know how to navigate these systems? And so thankfully you have places like Casa San Jose who are providing some of these supports um, for folks who've been arrested. I know that they do some work around um, having uh, pro bono attorneys to facilitate some of these conversations with folks who are detained on the South side at the ICE detention center. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I think just underscoring what's been said so far around language and the importance of culture and knowing who these folks are. I mean, the reality is like, you know, the, um, as Valerie said earlier, this, these groups are growing in Pittsburgh. I think, you know, I came across some stats a few days ago where, you know, in the greater Pittsburgh area, the foreign born population is 3.3%, which is about 75,000, but that in the city of Pittsburgh, especially uh, the foreign born population is actually twice as high with 8% of the population being foreign born, which is about 24,000 people. Um, specifically, you'll find that the total Asian population is 49,000 or 2.1%, and the Latino population is 30,000 or 1.3%. Both communities grew by 56% and 72% respectively in the past 10 years. So I think, you know, in thinking about that, and, and you'll find that, you know, in, in terms of the city of Pittsburgh, largest Asian American communities are in Shadyside, Square Hill, and North Oakland. Uh, Latino communities can be found in Beachview, Oakland, Greenfield, and Southside. And largest refugee communities are located in Carrick, Prospect Park, and Sharpsburg. So, you know, we are seeing this, this growth in Pittsburgh. And so I think, just wanted to underscore that again, in terms of providing accessible materials, accessible supports for families so that 
they are not lost in the mix about what's happening with their children, especially. Um, when you're talking about things like uh, ICE detention or rather police uh, with respect to the immigrant community, um, I'll use the example of um, the National Ju uh, Juvenile Justice Network indicated that you know, some of these local law enforcement systems are utilizing gang databases to identify um, immigrants that may be, that they deem at um, uh, trouble, so to speak. And so they're utilizing these databases that probably aren't the most accurate to round up immigrant community members and then detain them. And so, you know, this really does put involvement with, um, this does put immigrant youth at increased risk for involvement with the youth justice system because now they're being disproportionately targeted and in many cases profiled when that isn't the case. And so one of the recommendations from the National Ju Ju Juvenile Justice Network was to stop relying on gang databases when thinking about um, youth that are engaging in, in suspect behaviors or how to, how, to, how to look at youth that, you know, are, um, that they're trying to target or look out for. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there because I feel like I'm rambling, but I think just again, um, making sure that um, the language and, and cultural aspects are in place. And then also understanding too, one thing I will say, one thing understanding too is the relationship between local law enforcement and the courts. So if you have youth or adults that are immigrants um, and they've been you know, arrested and they're taken to the courts, the courts are gonna contact ICE in most cases. And so you'll have them then being detained by ICE detention, um, which you know, as was mentioned earlier, impacts so many other things in terms of accessing supports and then you know you now you're looking at another layer of deportation potentially so i'm gonna stop there because I, I feel like i'm rambling but just wanted to say that so. monica i'm gonna hand it over to you to kind of thread between these three narratives and then move the group over to q a sure i mean it was i think that you, this wasn't really planned to go after um the or the first conversation that we had but i'm so glad it, that it did because when you think about things, you know, and I'm not comparing not speaking English to a disability, but sometimes when you look at someone, you don't know if they speak English or not. And so we've got folks uh, that may look like they speak English and they can't, right? And so then you have the, this problem with the police then assuming that you're being non-compliant or, you know, and, and most of the people that are in this category are people of color. So we have to think about that. The second thing is culturally, right? And I think Dr. Williams said it perfectly, how it's in different countries, what's acceptable there is not acceptable here. And how can we educate people before we arrest people? And how can we, you know, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter what you did. It's not okay for the police to kill you, right? So what are we gonna do to start making those changes so that whatever it is that you did, you can actually get to the place where whatever the punishment happens is not being killed on the streets in front of your family. So there's that. And then, um, and then finally, Jose, thank you so, so much because um, I don't, I just, I wasn't bringing it in, but you know, sometimes a simple traffic stop can get someone killed. And sometimes a simple traffic stop can get someone deported. So we really have to be careful, especially in the schools where a kid who he might have just got here, he doesn't know, he might be defending himself, he might hit someone because he was just upset, and the next thing you know, that is what's getting him deported. Not necessarily because Pittsburgh police doesn't, you know, may not con uh, contact ICE, but the school police can. When you're talking about putting probation and parole officers into schools, armed, you know, those are not the types of things that need to be in schools, and. Again, you're right. Once you get to the court systems, I can come in at any time. So, you know, this is also a very vulnerable population and we have to remember and keep those things at the forefront when we're making recommendations. And I'll stop there. And so I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Uh, let me see, uh, David, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, I really want to thank everybody who spoke. I thought that was very, very, very interesting. I want to emphasize two things that I heard from two of the speakers and then ask a question. Um, the uh, suggestions um, uh, by, uh, forgive me, by uh, Keir for community liaison uh, and for training are absolutely crucial. Um, 
other cities create these community liaison positions as a matter of course with their police departments. I've been writing about things like that since the mid 2000s when I first saw them in places like Chicago. Um, uh, we can do this here too. I think that's a superb idea. And then as far as the cultural training, which a number of you spoke about, uh, I cannot agree more. That is so important. I remember watching a cultural training uh, in a small town in Massachusetts that I've, the name I've forgotten, but I, I ended up writing about this. The, the, it was a mutual training, a training of the community and of the police department by each other because uh, the gentleman who was running it from the community side, he was an immigrant, I think from Cameroon, and the tradition when you are stopped by the police in that country, uh, and I hope I don't have the country wrong, is two things are very important. Number one, to show respect, you get out of the car and you walk to where the police officer is. Number two, uh, men in this country would typically keep their wallet in, a, in their sock. And so this gentleman uh, would sh was showing how when he got out of the car, he did the two things that could get you killed in an American police situation. He approached the police officer and looked like he was reaching for a gun and an ankle holster. And it was so incredible to see the reaction of the police as they finally, you know, the light bulbs were going off. And then to turn it around, the police trained on their side, no, 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 don't do this. Stay in the car. Reach for things when we tell you, that kind of thing. I, I would make a strong pitch for mutual training like that. And it tends to bring people together in the bargain. Um, so I think both of those ideas are really, really good. Uh, the question that I want to ask uh, yeah, relates to something I heard from several of you. Um, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I was part of a working group inside the police department here in Pittsburgh to create a policy for the Pittsburgh police in their, in their uh, interactions with immigrants. And the then chief at the time, Nathan Harper, was very, very keen to get a policy in place that stopped his officers from asking them about immigration status. He did not want people getting confronted with that and perhaps being deported. And several of you have said things that suggest to me that maybe that policy is no longer in place or enforced. And I find that very, very kind of disturbing uh, and I'd like to know more about what maybe you know, and if you, if this is happening a lot, if people are being handed over to ICE as a sort of routine matter by Pittsburgh police, this is something we have to speak up about. David, Thank I can you. answer that question. So there is a policy and Pittsburgh police does not cooperate with ICE, but Pittsburgh police is one entity that you come in contact with when you get arrested. So once you get to the county jail, that has nothing to do with Pittsburgh police. And the county jail does share information with ICE, which they shouldn't because they've been sued, because they detained a woman who was an American citizen for over a week, that's 10 years right. ago. That's yes. right, they shouldn't do that because it's illegal, and that's correct. why they got sued, yes. And they, correct, and they do it. And if an ICE officer walks into the courtroom, they will take you out of the, So once you're out of Pittsburgh police hands, they, there's nothing they can do. Right, but so we're our concern is in the courts, in the county jail, and with school officers because they operate under a different set of you know. It's, that's it's very dangerous. It's, <clears throat> so that's why when to arrest someone because you can't understand them, that's we're trying to avoid that, right? So that's where that, that comes in. I have a I have a question. Uh, Tim, ago. we have someone ahead of you. We'll oh, I'm sorry, you. I didn't say that's it. All right, uh, Sharon. Sharon? Yeah, well, I was just going to follow up on David's points about, or um, thinking about community liaisons and the cultural training. So I understand we do have community liaisons, but I'm wondering, and this might be something we have to take back to the police department, but I'm just wondering if anyone can tell me the status of, do, do we have community liaisons? How many do we have? Do we have cultural training? Do we know what that covers? I'm not sure if anyone knows. In terms of the cultural training, I mentioned to the task force a few weeks ago that an RFP had just gone out to get a cultural competency training put together. That RFP has been extended for three weeks and so it is actually still live and out. And I did wanna bring it up to you all so that 
um, in whatever product uh, uh, report you end up putting together, if it's possible to take whatever comes out of the, the vendor that gets, um, the vendor that uh, wins this contract, I, I do want them to, to kind of be plugged into the recommendations that this task force makes so that it's not, all this work isn't happening in, happening in silos. Um, and then it, I'll, I'll look to my colleague, Lindsay, for your other question, Sharon. Can, can I just follow up on that though? Oh, for the sure. cultural training RFP, is that, are you, are you looking for a vendor that's gonna train on all culture? I'm not sure how, how it works. It would just be recognizing different cultural or cultural differences across different communities. So the idea and what's written into the RFP is that this vendor would actually work with immigrant communities so that the, the, the training itself is informed by these communities. And it is a training for the, the um, it's not just for Pittsburgh police, it's for all of public safety. So it includes EMS and fire. Um, it, it, is, it does not, however, cover the, the idea that was brought up earlier, which is have a, a two-ended training, both the training of the community and of, of uh, public safety. Can I just add one thing to that? So when, um, when I was working with the police department years ago about their ICE policy, um, it came up that they did have some sort of cultural training when they were in the academy. And a lot of police officers have been out of the academy for over 20 years. And if you look at the population, even right now, um, within the last five or 10 years, it's changed so much. And so I, I would suggest um, a push to have this ongoing, that just because you had it once doesn't mean that you're culturally competent, but you know, it's something that's more ongoing. Sharon, did I answer your question? Um, this is Lindsay. I just wanted to say quickly, uh, Sharon, I think what you were referring to is the NRO and CRO programs, which are the community resource officers as well as, as well as the neighborhood resource officers. I will say they serve a different purpose, I think, than what I'm understanding um, David has looked into because they are not civilian liaisons. They are um, officers who are dedicated to working um, with community members. They're the ones that are really going to the you know, birthday parties on the block, they're the ones that are organizing, you know, cookouts and things like that. Um, but they are trained officers, they aren't um, civilians. Um, there have been conversations uh, within Welcoming Pittsburgh about what a, a deeper connection or relationship between the NRO CRO program looks like with the welcoming community. Um, uh, but those are definitely ongoing. Uh, but it, again, it's a little, I think what David's talking to, talking about is, having a civilian liaison who is uh, more, uh, I would say, genuinely like a part of the community, quote unquote, working with officers similar to how our GBI program works, which is our gang violence intervention program, which um, our civilians who are paid um, to interrupt violence as it happens, uh, particularly in group violence, gang violence intervention uh, issues. Thanks. Angela? Yes, so um, one of the earlier comments spoke to hiring from within the community and there was a reference made that I guess there were some who had gone through the process but weren't successful. Do you have any thoughts on what the barriers are to um, people from the community either being recruited to enter the process or once entering the process not completing? Um, so I, I actually uh, know people who have gone through the process. I think just by design, the process is not that easy. It's not only for immigrants or refugees, just in general. It's a lot of steps and a lot of process that you have to follow. So I think that's just make it hard. Uh, but the other part that I think will be helpful is, um, and we've talked about this within Welcoming Pittsburgh, when the police is doing the recruitment, uh, actually do the, like intentionally going to this community maybe with a one page and show them this is what you need to apply and these are the requirements uh, because for some of these folks even if they may meet the requirement it may not be easy just for them to navigate the system on their own um, so that that's what it is it's not just like a hard, it's i think the way just design in general it's not an easy uh, process so um, and i know somebody who went through all of it 
and was almost at the end, but something else happened that had nothing to do with the, the system in place. He was not able to continue, but um, so I know it's, it's very, uh, you know, they have to do physical tests. They have to take all kinds of uh, exams and all that. So I think making the process easy and going to these communities and showing them, this is what you need. Are you interested? Many of them, you know, may be interested, but then some of them may meet the, these requirements. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Tim? I have two. One is a question and, and one is a request. I'm going to ask the same request of our guests in this part of our call. And Monica, maybe you could assist with the coordination of this, if you will, if you will. I'm chair of the subcommittee on recruiting, hiring, training. Our goal with this task force is that we get as much information as possible, as many specific recommendations as possible that we can give to the mayor and to the police administration. So my request is that those who are on the call come up with as many specific suggestions as you can. Exhaust your brains. Because this group that you see will go away. We'll be around, but not together. This task force will disappear. So we need to take advantage of the existence of the task force. So I'm asking that every specific, I call them summary points versus bullet points. Every summary point suggestion that you have even outside of this room that you can ask for other people to get suggestions. We want them and we want them as soon as possible. This is Monday. You can get them within the week, week and a half or so because we don't have that much time left. We wanna be able to assemble, decide what we're recommending. So the sooner the better. Do you all accept to do that in your own way? Yeah, we can work with Monica. I can get you something tomorrow, but we'll work with Monica. I, I love people like that. Put that in, put that in the minutes. You know? <laughs> we'll work with Monica. Yep. Yeah. The other question yeah. I have is, uh, Johnny Gamage was killed October 12th, 95. Some of you may have heard of that. Uh, death became a national story. And he died from positional asphyxiation, as did George Floyd in a different way. He was His air was cut off by officers from the suburban communities of Pittsburgh. Out of that, Vic Volchek from the ACLU and I, in my position as NACD president at the time, we had several community meetings. And we created the You and the Police brochure, what to, stop by the, what to do when stopped by the police. Since then, we've had about three reincarnations. The last one was unveiled, I believe it was April 16th, I think, last year in the presence of the chief, and in the presence of the sheriff uh, from our county and representatives of other police departments, we have a, a very powerful document. And our police in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County and some of the other outlying have agreed every officer has to read that brochure, sign off that they've read it, and take a quiz that they've read it based on the You and the Police brochure, the newest one. We worked to, together with Citizen Police Review Board, Beth Pittenger and I have worked very closely on that. My question is, is the immigrant community aware of that document? And is it in any language other than English? Hmm. I think it might be, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm, no, I'm not aware of that document. I don't know if Allah, if you know, I know there are several documents that have been translated in other languages, but I'm not sure about that. I think that's that. an important one. It's only eight okay. panels. It's like one big sheet, double-sided, a legal side, I think, double-sided is eight panels. And when we met with the chief on November 18th, 2018, is when we got that commitment that every officer has to read this thing. And we expanded it on his suggestion we added two more panels of information, street encounters. So it's every encounter that we have. So um, <clears throat> I can check from, I'll give myself a homework assignment to check with Beth Pittenger, the director of the Citizen Police Review Board, to ask, is it at least in Spanish 
And my secondary question is, since we're trying to improve community police relations, to the staff on the line from the mayor's office, could we get that document uh, written in several languages, or at least a couple of few? Is that doable? Yes, if, if this is something that the group wants, it can certainly be translated. Um, this is Yinka. Mr. Stevens, is it possible yes. for you to provide that probably to Allah who can forward it to us or Lindsay who can forward it to us so that um, we see and understand it and then be able to make that decision if it is what we think will be beneficial to the immigrant community? I will give myself that assignment as well. Thank and, you. And Allah is permitted to harass me tomorrow if you don't have it by noon. Um, At it. If, if right. I may. Monica, I need you, um, I'm part of the prison society. If there's something that's going on down the county jail, especially with the ICE stuff that you, you just spoke of, would you get that information back to me so that um, we also bring stuff up to the oversight board of the Allegheny County Jail? So that is indeed an issue. I really want to um, help you address it. One of my staff attends those uh, every time that they have them and, um, and talks about it there, presents it, brings it to their attention. We've reached back out to Vic from the ACLU. We've done a lot of work on this and it's just, they don't stop. They won't stop. They won't stop doing it. All right, I wanna, I wanna see if I can uh, do something to assist you with that. So if you Thank email you. me after this, uh, I'll talk to you. This is Valerie. The one thing, Monica, is on, I believe it's October the 17th, we will be hearing a presentation from the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, which is NOBLE, the acronym. Uh, the president is the assistant superintendent of the county police, Marita Bryant. So she may be able, you may want to hold that and possibly she can shed some perspective on like why why there's no resolution, why um, there's no movement. Uh, so she's on the ground with this. So this is a thought. And that's August 17th versus October. What, did I say October? I want yes. to be. That's <laughs> well, Listen, Qu Quentin could not wait to extend this committee for another couple of months. <laughs> Over. <laughs> At least two more months. Um, <laughs> Are there any more questions from the task force? Um, just one more comment, and I want to get back to one of the issues that Mr. Harris has spoken about earlier on, which had to do with Chief Harper when he was on. I think I still remember very well one of the ways in which we got nearer to resolving issues and for law enforcement to kind of better understand the community was not a one-way traffic, it was both ways. We had meetings that had to do with police chiefs. It took us, yes, a whole lot of time before we could get them to the table, but they did come. And when they came, it was not us who spoke. It was the immigrant population themselves who got up and who spoke about what it is that they've been through, what their plights have been around. And it was only then that we found out that things were better understood. So again, there might have to be another meeting or even meetings of meetings at which this type of um, discussion will take place, whereby the higher ranks do understand this is what we are dealing with. You're not dealing with just one person. Each time you arrest that one person, you are arresting sometimes a whole community and sometimes an entire family, and this is the way it actually impacts them. So the people spoke for themselves, and I believe that was the turning point at which we started having some kind of um, impact, um, not just about arrest, but again, just in terms of um, what kind of actions do we get from law enforcement when things are happening. So community meetings with law enforcement, I believe is absolutely important as part of um, our discussions on whatever we need to do. Any more questions from the task force member? Would that be included in your suggestions from the group? 
Dr. Ngega Williams? Yes, we can work with uh, Dr. Williams. Yes, please. Here yes, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, Dr. Yinka Williams, uh, Kia Mendeza, Jose Diaz, Ala, uh, Muhammad Monica Rias, we want to extend our thanks and appreciation for you uh, today in presenting this very helpful information on the immigrant and refugee communities. And you've offered some great insight and some uh, thoughtful recommendations. And um, we look forward to getting the follow-up requests for further review and integration into the work that we are compiling for our report. So thank you for taking time out of your evening and we look forward to continuing the conversation and future opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, task force, we have had two great presentations, uh, a wealth of information, uh, and uh, we are now going to transition over into uh, our reporting and just talk about how will we integrate the subcommittees into one voice. Uh, there is no one solution, one strategy to do this. Uh, so I'm open to hearing anyone's thoughts. I'll share what I think could be one possible uh, process and that is uh, as after we complete all of the presentations and the committees have completed all of their reports. We present the reports, present and, present and discuss each report and allow for input exchange from task force members and agree on the content and the report. Then once all of the reports have been completed, uh, a small group, including my staff, will then work to put it into one report, send it back out for review to get feedback from the entire task force until we get the report finished. Other thoughts, suggestions, and how you think this could also be achieved, please share. Angela, Sharon. Yeah, so, so when you say report, are you using that word kind of loosely? Because Yes, I am. I wasn't looking at writing a report, but putting forth recommendations and some summary comments. That's correct. And also next steps. Okay. Correct, yes. I should say submitted, subcommittee summary. I, so similarly to what Angela was thinking, I don't know if there's um, like a format that we want to go by. It doesn't have to be super strict that people have to follow a specific format, but maybe like this is totally off the top of my head, a suggestion, but maybe like, here's the back, here's who we talk to about these subjects or, you know, within the Pittsburgh community. Here's what the Pittsburgh police are already doing in this area. And here are our recommendations moving forward and kind of acknowledge some will be short term and long term. All right, that's a good thought. I see Bobby, is your hand up? Was that up from before? No, it is up. Uh, I do think in terms of organizing that we start with our charge and our scope and then follow through. I think it would be really helpful for me that if each of the subcommittees could advance their main recommendations with any references uh, accordingly, that we all have an opportunity to read over those recommendations before we come to a full meeting so that we can respond to or make edits or modifications or additions to those recommendations and then send off the uh, those summary recommendations to the writing group whoever would be charged with that piece of synthesizing the information and then i do think that it would be really important to include a list of guest presenters and uh, that we've heard from that have informed the process as uh, you know in terms of the references to the report all right good good point other thoughts yeah valerie um i was going to suggest to people not to feel that the weight of having to generate a list of recommendations with um not necessarily footnotes but references etc etc uh, please feel free 
that um, in, in help and getting the staff to help pull this together. It's not that they're going to write it, but they can provide some level of support to pull it together, even in a um, kind of like a raw data venue so that uh, Dr. Bullock and others can, um, probably be me too, but that we can seamlessly, the, the object is to have a seamless um, report um, with a consistent format, uh, but just to have the um, basically a list of recommendations and facts or what have you that you want to be included. Feel free that you don't have, you're a volunteer. So um, feel free to ask staff for assistance if you so need it. I'm uh, getting but, my Sorry staff, sorry. <laughs> Angela, were you, was your hand still up? No, I, I put it up again. So since we started, a lot of things have happened. So, you know, other policies have been passed, some other changes. How are we factoring that in to what we're creating? Like I'm thinking about city council and things. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll have to find that at some support reference, uh, if we agree to what they are recommending, that that can be incorporated as some of our re, uh, reinforcement, reaffirmations of what they are proposing. It's kind of a crossover, but we want to find some way of, of endorsing what is coming forth as a part of our recommendation. Okay. Um, for the group, I did get a tax back from Beth Pettinger. No, the document is not in any language other than English. Uh, she had asked the Pittsburgh Hearing and Speech to translate it into Spanish and Nepalese, looking for money to do it. So that's the answer on that. Um, in terms of the structure, are we assuming that the structure of the report would be by categories? And that's what we are talking about. We've gotten several ideas and once we get them all, I'll synchronize those into some format and present back by next week for your review. And then going forward, you could use that as your template uh, to prepare the reports. So we're gathering recommendations. I see, David, you have your hand up. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to uh, answer a little bit uh, uh, Angela's question because it really has impacted uh, the work for on use of force um, we have both uh, uh, resolutions that have now become city law passed, uh, I think last week, that are directly uh, in the use of force uh, area. And of course, we have looking further back, we, ca we also have the mayor endorsing things like eight can can't wait and some other things. So my plan for, uh, for, uh, for those is to incorporate them um, and to say these things, you know, that we would recommend anyway, they're already law. Uh, so unless we disagree with them in some way right. or want them to be further improved, uh, those actually are pretty nice supports for what we're already going to do. Um, so I, I don't, so far I haven't seen anything that's a hindrance uh, and I've looked at those items I mentioned pretty carefully already. Uh, and I, so I think those things can actually be used to support some of the things that we might have wanted anyway. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I'll just stop there for now. All right. Bobby, is your hand still up? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of further that point that there are a lot of parallel activities going on and that I, I think we want to be clear in the introduction of the report of what the report is and is not in the moment in time that it comes before the community because it is a little confusing. It was a little confusing to me in the beginning of our meetings that you know, this office was established, this legislation was being put forward. It's all happening in the same, at the same time. So I think we just need to, to be clear about that as we put the report together. What if we have a section of the report where the following things have been agreed to by the mayor and or city council or passed and or passed or edicts, executive orders, whatever, 
uh, could be that, that the committee is, or the task force is in agreement with, so they're one place, people can see these are the recommendations made, these are those that we're in agreement with, but have since during the process been passed or accepted. It would be a separate hey, subsection. Hey, this is Valerie, I hear where you're coming from. Um, uh, Dr. Bullock and I talked about this um, some, a little, uh, some time ago, is with a lot of the, um, I don't want to call it kerfuffle, but a lot of the activity that is surrounding police reform and, it come, and it's coming from different um, entities of, of recommendations. And how do we use that? Um, as we talk, it is impossible for us to keep up with all the activity. And we should not, as Dr. Bull said, we should not gear our reports based upon other people's activities. What we need to do is say what the, what the task force is recommending, and then not as a separate uh, appendix or subsection, but right within the body, acknowledge uh, activities that have already gone on, legislation that has been signed in, um, possibly even what um, administratively the uh, pub Department of Public Safety and the police department and whomever, what has already happened. It, um, it, it basically, I, I, my vision is that this report would be pretty much encompassing and at the same time acknowledging um, accomplishments as well as goals within the body, just within the body. And I, it should be um, content, um, Oh, how am I trying to say it? By the committee, it shouldn't, um, we shouldn't segregate what's already been done. It should be within the confines of police training, everything involving police training should be there. What we want, what's recommended, what's been done, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's that's kind of like where my thoughts are. So you're saying under specific subjects, you would put what's already been agreed to? I and think then it under was, another subject, what's already been agreed to. Is that what you're saying? It's similar to it's what uh, what uh, David was just explaining, right. that as a part of your subcommittee, anything that has been passed, if you are endorsing that as, uh, as a part of the recommendations going forward, that's an ideal location. If it doesn't interconnect with any of the subcommittees, we can explore ways that that can be incorporated into the conversation. Right. Um, Richard? I think we have to be careful, you know, because although I agree with uh, what people have said thus far, but there are people in the community that are thinking that um, this group is just, it's not, it doesn't have no teeth to it or it doesn't have um you know it's 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 not really at the heart of the matter you know and if we start you know i'm i'm worried about the different legislations that have been passed if this group was just put together so that we could justify some of the things that that's been passed or you know uh you know that we really what we really really didn't do anything so I, we got to be careful just from my point of view from the different conversations that i've had with uh people remember we will all review the report to endorse or suggest changes to ensure it represents what we collectively want the report to represent okay so, so all the ideas that we're putting out in the end it still will be reviewed by the entire task force for comments, suggested changes, deletions, whatever is necessary for us to reach a final agreement on our collective effort. All right, uh, Nathaniel. Yeah, I was just gonna um, respond to um, Richard's comments and as well as yours, Dr. Bullock, um, which I, I agree with what, um, I, I understand the concerns that Richard is raising, that we don't wanna appear to be just as a, a blind rubber stamp to whatever it is the city is doing. And I completely understand that. Um, I also agree with Dr. Bullock though, that to the extent that there's been legislation either proposed or passed, whether it be at the city municipal, municipal level, the state legislative level, 
or for that matter, the federal legislative level as well, I think us weighing in on those various pieces of legislation and whether they agree with our viewpoints makes a lot of sense. And um, for that matter, we might agree with what's already been done, but we might want to take it further potentially. I just, I, I agree with the view that we should be independent and whatever has been proposed might align um, with what we think and we might even want to push it further potentially. So uh, I do think we need to think about municipal, state, and federal um, and, and just respond to what's been done as it pertains to each of the individual subject pieces that we've been discussing. So just more of a comment. All right. and, and, and that's where the staff can come in and pull a lot of that together. There, um, there are so many different balls in the air when it comes down to police reform. This is an opportunity to pull it all together in one document so everyone can see, to your point, Nat, what is happening locally, what's been done, what needs to be done, what's aspirational, um, what's happening at the state local. It needs to, it needs to be a readable report to get a full understanding. What is police reform looking like in Pittsburgh? What that's the document. David. Yeah, I would just add uh, in response to both Richard and, and Nat and now Valerie too, I mean, as I envision what the use of force section uh, recommendations will look like, uh, the things that have already been done are just there as sort of starting points. Uh, we'll be pushing beyond uh, those things. Uh, there won't be any mistaking what we, uh, at least if it's close to what I'm thinking of now, uh, and I've put it out to my group, uh, if that's the picture that emerges, nobody will be able to say, well, they just, you know, they didn't do anything beyond what's already been done. So uh, I think those, those things that have already been decided are just opportunities for us to say, okay, these are nice things. These are starting points. We already got this, but we're going beyond. I have to jump off in a second. Um, apologies that I have to go, but um, I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss. Have we figured out our timing yet? I know we had originally said Labor Day and then we thought that was that my next question. <laughs> too optimistic. Yeah. Do we have any better sense of timing? Um, the timing is, again, is flexible. We want to allow all the input from our community constituents to make their presentation or, or documents for review. And then we will take time to continue to work in our subcommittees until the subcommittees feel they have exhausted all of their uh, work and compilation of materials, summarize it. And then once that's summarized, we will then just spend time with each other, discussing and reviewing those reports, pulling it together to agree on the content, and then the writing team will take it all and then pull into that final document to go back out to the committee. I still push, let's get as much as we can, just keep pushing. I, I agreed not to say Labor Day, but I just ask that we keep pushing and writing. And if we meet that time frame, excellent. If we go beyond that time frame, okay. All right. Okay. This is Sorry, that. I gotta go. All right, we're going to get off shortly this, also. Uh, thank, thank you, Sharon. This, this is a, a request, a question I have of the group. Do we agree collectively that our goal, because we have a lot of information we've gathered from across the nation in our own brains and, as I said, experts and interested individuals, that our goal is to have the most comprehensive package that we can find that Pittsburgh will have, if not the most, one of the most comprehensive police reform packages in the country. Is that our goal? That's our goal. Just do as detailed, comprehensive as we can with uh, solid recommendations and content. If I took this camera over, you'll see on my floor, I have several sheets of paper with different things marked on under different categories. My request is that even though it could be bit of a strain that we try to aim for over day and just have we have uh, subcommittees that have a, a couple extra meetings or something to get it done uh, this isn't totally rocket science it's science but it's rocket science if we can 
in our own subcommittees try to really get this work done. Everyone is doing that. I don't think anyone's not doing that. That's everyone's commitment. I'm just saying that we keep that date in mind consciously as much oh. as we humanly. Oh, you mean the, the early September. Gotcha. All right. And, and the other concern about that is going back to Rich. Uh, there was someone who I highly respect in the community who didn't want me to serve on this committee at all. And there are people who were concerned about the committee uh, not really delivering. So I'm sure none of us on this committee want to be part of something that doesn't deliver. And I just want it to be as credible a report as we can get, one that we'll be proud of for years to come, and one that will actually make a difference. We will all be proud. Okay. All right. But Tim, I, I do want to say, let's not be naive in thinking that this is going to be, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, um, or that everyone's going to just be, you know, parading in the streets over this report. You are <laughs> going to have people. You are going to have people that are going to say it's nothing. They didn't defund no. them. You're going to find that. I, that that's not my goal. I am not really cognizant of anybody who is set up to basically set, be the naysayer. I'm set up to do what we were charged to do, is to be, as Dr. Bullock said, as comprehensive. But, I'm, but we cannot do our work with the, in the back of our minds thinking, well, is this going to be how other people are going to feel? You know, that's not my concern. My concern is generating a good report, an excellent report. And that is the goal. What is, no, the is the goal? What is the goal? Honestly, whatever and, we do, we and come wait, up I, I, wait, it's to I'm make sorry. sure that mm -hmm. the administration has mm -hmm. a broad view of what is needed for Pittsburgh. It is to gener it is generated on behalf of the for the mayor to implement for years and years to come, regardless of who's the mayor. That's correct. But it's not a showcase. It's not entertainment, and it, it's not to um, it's not a song and dance. It is not. No. In fact, it probably will be boring to most people. <laughs> probably a lot will be. Yeah, it'll be boring. But hopefully it'll be it'll be in depth, yes. effective, and we'll be able yeah. to Absolutely. The team we're slowly losing members, so we want to be respectful of everyone's family time and the hours getting late. I again extend my thanks to the entire task force. Uh, as well as staff for your continued support of our efforts. I will um, com compile the information you share for format and I'll get that back out to you so it can serve as a guide and we can revise as necessary. If no further comments, I bid farewell. Any closing comments, Val? No, nothing. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. All righty. Everyone have a good evening. Take have care.